next 20 minutes or so I'll go through um, uh, some things I come across, some work that we do uh, based on um, the hundreds and hundreds of data centres I seem to have been in over the past few years. I want to explain where people are using cooling as a, um, um, as a framework for change. Exploiting one simple bit of physics. Firstly, if you're trying to cool a data centre, it's cold outside most of the time. This is not a difficult concept. But also, outside on hot days, it's also low relative humidity. And there's a thing called the wet bulb temperature of the air, which if you put water in contact with air, it will cool down. And there is actually a way of using that in a variety of ways to cool your data centre and save capital costs, save OPEX, and also make life a little bit more simpler. Right, conventional data centres. Okay, right, what are people looking at? Um, piece of fridge kit, and we're trying to achieve these things called ASHRAE standards typically. You'll see temperature and relative humidity criteria. Some people have very narrow views on that. Some people have open views on what temperature ranges, relative humidity ranges, and also rates of change are acceptable for their particular operation. So people concentrate a lot about temperature and humidity. A lot of people don't actually understand what the airflow in their data centre is. The last presentation mentioned about the importance of getting hot air away from your servers and your IT equipment. People look at kilowatts in the data centre. It's not kilowatts in the data centre. There's a bit of a mathematical formula there. Q is equal to MCP delta T. What that actually means for your megawatt of data centre, you will typically need about 85 cubic metres per second of air to support it. Some equipment might only need 60 cubic metres per second of air to support a, um, um, a megawatt. Other equipment might need 120, even 150. So your kilowatts cooling demand is too simplistic a view. And on top of that, it's how well do you use that air. Now you'll I, um, um, uh, this is taken from uh, uh, a guy called Robert Tozer, Operational Intelligence, and they analyze data centers and look where all the air goes. People talk about virtualization, etc., on their on their IT side making best use of all the available resources to you, most people aren't using their air very efficiently. That's big cost and also potential problems when you're not distributing the air problems so you have hot spots and cold spots. And it's costing you a lot of money to keep all this kit going. Right. So, what we're wanting to do, really simplistic view, can't we just use fresh air to keep this data centre cool? Because it's also expensive. And there is a holy grail that people are chasing about having a cooling system with no mechanical refrigeration. Compressors, chillers, etc. Two is one reason is cost. Another is power availability. If you've got a PUE of 1.6, you'll see 0.6 of your energy is, t is taken out of your infrastructure, out of your total supply onto site. The opportunity cost of that is high. And many sites have run out of power, therefore cooling is limiting their business growth. Because we're not just <laughs> wanting a cooling solution here. What we'll kind of go through, there's a sort of business solutions people are looking for from their total infrastructure, including their cooling. Now, fresh air has been around for a long time. Okay. Um, and before you make any decision to move from your existing um, method of cooling, ASHRAE TC.9.9, their technical ability to define the operating environment for a data centre, is actually a really good document. And it asks you to look at your data centre and balance risk against cost. You can make a change to your operating conditions, but the consequences you might not be aware of. You can in increase, for instance, the temperature of the air supply to your servers. Hey, my chillers suddenly run a lot, a lot more efficient. Hang on a minute, though. Suddenly the fans start working harder in the servers because the temperature's gone up. That means they consume more energy. 
can make your PUE look good, but you might be consuming more energy totally. <coughs> you increase the air supply, the noise levels can go up into, in your data centre as those fans speed up. As things get hotter, they become, common sense, more unreliable. Not just the servers, but power distribution kits sitting at the back end of the servers. You lift your supply temperatures to 27, if you've got blade servers, you might have hot hour temperatures of 40 or 42 degrees centigrade. That is just hot for equipment, and also if you're the techie at the back plugging things in. So it's quite a good document, very good document, and if you're taking any serious decision making <coughs> on cooling in your data center, it is well worth a read. Very, very good document. I'm right, so it's cold outside, why don't we just, just bring in fresh air and problem solved. As always, it's not quite as simple as that. It has been talked about a long time and people have put into some quite provocative um, uh, put proofs of concept. Intel did a you know, study out in the desert where they just put in what they call an economizer, which is just a fancy name for a fan, and ran two high density data centers alongside each other for a while and claimed massive, massive reductions in uh, cooling energy power and no significant failures of equipment, and this stuff was just covered in, the kit was covered in dust. However, that's a totally unacceptable solution for almost anyone I know. So, why is it unacceptable, just direct, in the simplistic form? We've got common sense, we've got to filter particles out of the air. We can't necessarily accept widely varying ratio, rates of uh, change of our rate, low RH potential um, <coughs> static electricity problems, high RH increased corrosion rates, etc. High temperatures, obviously, a no no. Low temperatures is what a lot of people don't appreciate. A lot of modern equipment will shut down at 10 or 12 degrees centigrade. Okay, when you're in a warm climate. But in a UK climate, you cannot just put minus 10 degrees centigrade air into, into, a, into a data center. As you go further north, when it gets to Arctic Circle, you certainly can't. So, what's been one of the emerging technologies which addresses those problems? You will see a lot of indirect systems coming on the market now, where we actually separate the two air streams together, so the data center is its own enclosed space with no external contaminants and, um, and very efficient, because we're still using the fresh air on the, on the side of, the, of your, of your uh, air cooling circuit of your data center using fresh air through a simple heat exchanger and a fan. However, on hot days, because you've got that slight temperature differential between <laughs> Uh, the airflow going over the heat exchanger and into the airstream to the data center is you can't actually maintain compliant conditions all the time. So all indirect cooling processes using normal equipment have to introduce an element of mechanical refrigeration to solve the problem <coughs> on the hot days. So what do we do? Remember I mentioned this thing about the wet bulb temperature of the air. So, we know it gets hot. In Britain, in London, we can get to 38, 40 degrees centigrade back in 2005, 2007. But the wet bulb temperature of the air in the UK never gets above 22 degrees centigrade. So what you've got on any form of air ventilation system, either direct or indirect, is the opportunity to take that air and put it across a, an adiabatic cooling process and create air in the very low 20s. So that then allows you to introduce a temperature reduction in either direct or indirect, which knocks the temperature out of the ambient air so you can continue using this free cooling, what people would say, for longer and longer periods. And that's a typical big indirect evaporative, uh, uh, indirect um, uh, cooler where you'll see Munters Oasis, um, X Cools, and you'll have seen all these type of products around. Right, let's go back to the direct cooling. 
you know, this way. Like, can we just use the fresh air? Let's get rid of all this other equipment and potential losses. So what you can do, and what happened on the early days, people would just put a set of um, their evaporative coolers, that's just a box with a, um, a fan in it and a set of wetted filter pads. On cold days, it just pushes air into the building. On hot days, they invoke the water circulation system so you get down close to wet bulb temperature of the air. Problem is, no temperature control. So all that you have to do is introduce a recirculation loop like a conventional air handler, no complicated than that, and you've got a temperated air going to your data center. And what you can get, for instance, in the UK is a data center running at 21 degrees centigrade plus or minus half a degree centigrade just using some simple wet as filters, three dampers and some fans. Okay, right. So, let's just talk a bit more about efficiency. A perennial problem, and I'm to put, this is a big indirect, uh, evaporative co uh, indirect cooler, um, but it applies to everything, is one major problem in cooling design, particularly in big data centers, is I'm making all these assumptions based on fresh air temperatures whether you're putting chiller plants in, whether you're putting DX with condensers, whether you're putting direct or indirect in, if you've got any level of density of your plant equipment outside, preventing that recirculation of air is paramount to exploiting the maximum amount of free cooling. We've then got these very, very hot days to deal with, record hot days. So we will look at we'll look at these conditions. And when you're designing a, a resilient data center, then your infrastructure should be capable of supporting not just the average conditions outside, it has to be capable of, co co of coping with the extreme temperatures. Now in London, we have had 37 degrees centigrade ambience. That actually manifests itself as temperatures in the 40, 45 degrees centigrade around your condensers or dry chillers or whatever. So your equipment needs to be designed to accommodate that. Now, one thing that I believe is that we've had um, seven or eight years of cool weather. Many cooling systems aren't capable of supporting the next 37 degrees centigrade day we get in Britain. Okay, so hot days, what do we do? With the indirects, we have the adiabatic cooling process, which is cooling the air down. But because of the temperature dif differential across the heat exchanges indirectly, we still have to put a piece of mechanical refrigeration in that system somewhere to cool that air just to take the last few degrees off. So if you're wanting to maintain a data center at even sensible temperatures, an indirect system in our climate can't cope without additional mechanical refrigeration. So we're seeing some very efficient systems coming out in indirect. Um, however, they still haven't hit that holy grail of no mechanical refrigeration. <coughs> A lot of people are very dismissive of chilled water systems. I come across some very, very efficient systems. If you're designing a data center and you give, you give due attention to efficient design of the plant and equipment, it does end up being quite big, not necessarily expensive. But if you're designing low energy airflow systems low energy pump systems, maximizing the, the, your, free, your free cooling, introducing adiabatic cooling into your dry chillers. Then, for instance, down at Everest, um, down in Reading, they are seeing a PUE of well less than 1.1 on a chilled water system. Very impressive. But down there, they started from scratch and designed everything themselves with this in mind. Not cheap, it's about efficient, and 
uh, and low cost. One thing that most people don't understand or appreciate is the cube rule, right? We talk about Moore's law all the time, but people forget about the cube rule. If you're running fans or pumps, it's the energy follows a cube rule. So if you half the speed of a fan, it's only used 12.5% of the energy. Slowing things down is great. Slowing fans down means there's less noise, there's less energy, there's less load on your filters, etc., etc., etc. It's a good thing. And any control system should accommodate that maximize, maximize of your efficiency of your fans by minimizing the speeds all the time. And you can get some pretty Im impressive results, particularly at park capacity. Most data centers I go in, they might not be very clever on their IT utilisation, but they're generally oversized for their infrastructure. Their infrastructure is oversized. One megawatt data centre with, with 200 kilowatts in it. You don't stand a chance of getting good efficiency with traditional equipment at those, at those levels of utilisation. I'm going to challenge one of those things Mr Bittling said earlier on, right about this point zero zero. 25% efficiency. <laughs> this is a major telco operator in the UK with 6,000 buildings and 22,000 cooling systems. Okay. Spending £60 million a year on cooling their telco operations. Okay. By introducing this design of ours for direct fresh air with evaporative cooling on the hot days that's reduced their light-for-light -like energy use against already an efficiently fresh air DX unit by about 80%. Okay. So, whilst it's only 0.0025% of the big picture, when you're still a big company like this, potentially knocking, knocking 50 million quid off your OPEX is always going to make people think, isn't it? And you start getting crazy levels of performance. You now, coefficients of performance are over 30. These are, these are significant numbers. I actually altered my presentation during the coffee break because this is... Uh, this, this, what's happening up in the north does reflect a lot of the things that have been said earlier about power, energy... Uh, sustain renewable energy, etc. In the far north, up around Lulia, it's cold, and it's got a lot of power. So Facebook have built um, a, a big data centre. No refrigeration. Few sprays, few fans, few filters. But that reflects a lot of good practices. So it's not just a low-cost cooling system. They've also challenged their whole power distribution, only a single conversion all the way through. Conventional data centres up and down through UPSs 240 eventually end up that. No, one step change. BT, for instance, have done that for 20 years, only one change. There's a time when this type of thinking, all those inefficiencies of all those conversion processes, cannot be clever. The world has got to move on. Very interesting, very interesting building, but not very modular. Great if you're Facebook and you've got X um, uh, megawatts of known load and you shift it around the world like Google and people like that. But if you're heading towards um, uh, the two kilowatt rack or a smaller uh, or small data center, any relevance. So... It's cold up north. You can achieve 20, 21 degrees centigrade all year round using evaporative cooling and, um, and, uh, and fresh air. So this is what I've changed during the, uh, during the coffee break. There's an organisation called the Node Pole who've got 3,500 megawatts of spare capacity sitting up around all hydroelectric power from the sitting by a uh, uh, place called Lulia up in the uh, top end of Sweden. So you've got low temperature, 
where you can cool your data center for very little. Lowest cost electricity in Europe, I think it's three cents a kilowatt hour. Okay. And this all comes from completely renewable hydroelectric power. However, when there's only got three small towns around the top end of that say, it isn't actually easy to get that three and a half thousand uh, megawatts anywhere else. So they use it for data centers. And I'm just doing a project now with a company called Hydro 66, building a 20 megawatt data center, very modular, 20 megawatt data center in two megawatt buildings, all off the central spine, but broken down into 200 kilowatt pods. Okay, and then each server down to, uh, sorry, each rack down to averaging about 10 to 15 kilowatts. <coughs> So who's interested in this stuff? Oh, and also, if you look at, in terms of the, the, um, the tree-hugging bit, in terms of your carbon footprint on, on that graph side, it's absolutely minuscule. Without the opportunity cost of taking that electricity away from other people who could <coughs> use it, this is spare, this is just waiting to be used. This is a very specialised and specific area, but what is interesting, right, is, and this is what I was thinking about, is that you've got all these <coughs> gigawatts of power up there. Now they've got this good connectivity around to the rest of Europe. Are we actually just sending data and substituting power down a fibre network rather than sending electricity through a distribution system? What I think this will challenge is a lot of preconceptions about I want my data centre in the East End where I can get to it. I want my people on site. When you look at the smart data centers um, and um, the software defined practices, you say, do I need attendance? Because the only problem about being up there is it's hard to get there. I'm going there on Tuesday. Nightmare. Okay, right. So that is just a way that I think in terms of a, a data center of the future, using different technologies and different approaches to the business model, looks quite interesting to me. I can't show you the actual way that it's going to work, the system up there, because it's subject to a patent application. But one problem you do get using fresh air in the far north is that you'll get really low humidities in your data centre. <coughs> ASHRAE says equipment now is very resilient to low relative humidities and static electricity problems. No, we aren't completely convinced about this. Okay. So people are looking for avoiding low humidities. High humidity, so a different thing, because that's a combination between high humidity and con air contaminated air creating a corrosive environment in your data center. When you're in non-industrial locations and you're not near the sea, then you can use the fresh air at the high humidities without cr creating corrosion and with humidification, avoid any potential static problems through a con combination of humidification and good operating practice <coughs> of earthing and, uh, and wrist straps and things like that. And then we avoid the very low relative humidities and we can push our data centre using fresh air up into um, um, compliant zones. Because we don't all have the luxury of being a Facebook or a Google using our own trays that we can just let them blow up and replace another one. Most people are typically co-location and they've got to look after their kit um, subject to some sort of SLAs. Let's get closer to home. This is a data centre down by Red Hill. You can drive past this. You go past this in the train. This is a big um, uh, data processor for the oil and gas industry, um, about 1.1 megawatt. These guys now are using less than 40 kilowatts, uh, 40 kilowatts to support 1.1 megawatt of cooling. What are we doing there? We're using very efficient EC fans, which was mentioned earlier. We're using big filtration areas to filter out all those horrible particles from the horrible cars and trains going by it. We're using good control systems. <coughs> control is paramount. Okay. 
all those all those elements together I'm saying, about control. The other thing I'm going to mention about control. All these costs are plummeting. The cost of control is a fraction of what it was used to be. Old thinking about expensive, complex software uh, for control is gone. There are now things which are cheap as chips. You can buy derivatives of Raspberry Pis called Arduinos for a hundred pounds, which can run a small data center cooling system. Okay, it's just a matter of, of, of writing the code for it. So, with that system, I put a big tick there, that's a bit of a sales big tick, because you know with a fresh air system and slightly change of humidity, it isn't an absolute. But you can go a long, long way to solving those problems. And now we personally have got over 300 data centres running using fresh air evap cooling in the UK and across Europe without seeing significant changes in reliability beyond normal failure rates anyway. So then it all comes down to the actual stakeholders and their balance on their risk assessment of how much money do they want to save. And as a rule of thumb, you're going to use about 35 kilowatts for every mega of install load. That's your target. The previous company, CGG, they've tried everything. They've got um, serves in oil baths in Houston and everything. For them, a PUE of 1.3 is just the standard. If you're, not, if you're above 1.3, you're a poor performer in their organisation. So another benchmark that people need to start thinking about in terms of their operational performance. So, to summarise, there's no one answer to cooling these data centres. A whole series of of influencers need to be looked at to understand what's the best solution for either your data center or the one that you're designing or operating for someone else. <coughs> the technologies of direct fresh air, um, the, the economizers or the direct evaporative coolers, or you've got the indirect monitors, X cool, etc., against DX. DX is simple, great, very modular. Low capex, simple to understand, but it does take up a bit of space. Chilled water is always seen as expensive and maybe a little bit too big a chunk. You know, creating your resilience when one system goes down, how much resilience you've really got into a system. All of these, in one form or another, the most efficient systems do incorporate an element of evaporative cooling. So we put direct evaporative cooling just over a wetted filter for a direct fresh air system. The indirects use, that, use <coughs> evaporative cooling to knock some temperature out of that air just before it goes to the heat exchanger. The DX and the chillers are using spray systems on their condensers or whatever to reduce the air temperatures to make them more efficient. So you see evaporative cooling influence almost air, all areas of cooling data centres to get you to that, uh, to that uh, lowest OPEX and CAPEX. There are different solutions depending on where you are in the world, depending on where you are in Europe, depending on where you are in Britain. You're going to put a different solution in, in central London, than you are in Edinburgh because of the climate. You'll have a different solution in Madrid because it's hotter. And it isn't just the weather. You have things like on adiabatic systems, the cost and availability of water. Things like that. So all those things need to be taken into consideration. Understanding your local weather, understanding your aspirations for tiering, redundancy, resilience, whatever you want to call it, should be taken into account when you're putting your data centre of the future together. Or making your existing data center world-class with some retrospective um, uh, 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 installation of new technologies or new ways of thinking, process control, management, or actual equipment change. Brief overview there. 
I've only mentioned Moore's Law once, so I don't have to say twice now. So I apologise. Hopefully you found that interesting. Um, uh, thank you for listening. Thank you.